Hi again. This is Latin American Studies 3300, and this is our second class. And today we're going to talk about a number of topics, which I have up here on the outline. We will talk about, continue to talk about, really what uh, we had been talking about at the end of class last week, and that is the European and Iberian background to the encounter and the conquests. And then we're going to talk about a specific example of conquest, and that is the conquest of the Aztecs, which is the best known conquest because it is the best documented, but it also is the most important conquest. It's the conquest that really allowed the Spanish to understand the wealth in material goods, people, and lands that it was possible to find and to find and conquer in the Americas. And the conquests of the Aztecs, and I'll talk about the term Aztec a little later today, but the conquest of the Aztecs really involved the conquest of their capital city known as Tenochtitlan, which Professor Kuntz had mentioned. And Tenochtitlan was one of the largest cities in the world at that time. And the conquest of Tenochtitlan very possibly is the single largest conquest of a particular place that has ever occurred in world history. So it is uh, important for that reason as well. And it makes it important for us and a good example of the process of conquest and the, the consequences of conquest if I can put it that way. And so we need to talk about what happened, how it happened, why it happened, uh, and we'll do that today. And then we'll also talk about the Spanish colonizing process. And that's important as well, not only because it is important to understand the institutions that the Spanish put in place, but it's also important to understand that the conquest was really one, just one step in what's a really complicated process of human relations, social relations, technological change. Um, and it's that process of change that allows Spain to become a colonial empire, uh, allows it to become an imperial power in Europe, and thereby allows Spain to create a model that had a great deal of influence for other colonizing projects, not only on the Portuguese and how the Portuguese colonized Brazil, but for the French, the Dutch, and especially for the English. Although the English saw themselves as very different from the Spanish, and there were many differences in the way that England and Great Britain ran their colonies as compared to the Spanish, the, Sp the Spanish really did set the model that others either followed or reacted to. And so that helps explain why understanding the Spanish experience is so important. And of course, the colonial period and the colonial experience is crucial for understanding Latin American history and for understanding Latin American countries, societies, and political and economic processes of change. Even when we want to understand those in their contemporary forms, understanding what happened in the colonial period is crucial because what happened then underlies the way that those societies, their political systems, and their economic systems developed and evolved over time. But before we get to any of that, I want to spend a few minutes looking at maps. And that's what I have on the screen now. Yes, there it is. Um, the first map, there are two maps I want us to spend some time looking at. And you will also so find some maps in uh, the textbook and the book of readings that you have for the semester. It is important to have a sense of the location of the countries of Latin America, especially the countries that will be of the greatest interest for us this semester. So, of course, we see Mexico, um, and then we see Belize and Guatemala here, which are part of the unit that I talked about 
as constituting Mesoamerica. Below that, we find the countries of Central America. Then we see South America, and I've already talked about Brazil. That's been mentioned. We will not be able to cover every country that is part of South America, but we will talk about Brazil. We will talk about Argentina and Chile. We will talk about Peru. We will talk about Colombia and Venezuela and other countries such as Ecuador, Paraguay, Uruguay may well be mentioned along the way, but it's those major countries and regions that we will spend the most time on this semester when we talk about countries in South America. There's also the Caribbean, and I talked about the countries and islands that are important, that were important both in the period of exploration and the colonial period, as well as today, of course, Cuba. And Cuba has a great importance, not only because of its place in the early colonial period, and I'll talk more about that today, because Cuba was the launching ground for the Cortez expedition, which would be the expedition that will participate in the conquest of the Aztecs. We have Cuba. We have the island of Hispaniola, which has uh, the countries today, is co it's constituted by the countries Haiti and the Dominican Republic. And there is the island of Puerto Rico as well, which is part of the United States. So that's the map of Latin America. You can see, as I, as I mentioned in class last week, that it's very large. It has a huge land mass. It has a very large population. Politically, socially, it has close relations, though sometimes conflictual relations with the United States. And understanding the geography, just understanding the basic geography is important um, for understanding Latin America and understanding Latin American studies. And next is the map of Iberia. This is the Iberian Peninsula, and as I talked about last week, it lies between the southern part of Europe and the northern part of Africa. In the western region here, we have today's modern kingdom of Portugal and the modern nation of Portugal and the kingdom of Portugal was pretty much the same, had pretty much the same um, square miles, was fairly similar to the nation of Portugal today. And then while the modern nation of Spain uh, is somewhat larger than the regions that we're talking about during the colonial period, the Kingdom of Castile was here made up much of the center of what is today Spain and the Kingdom of Aragon was up in the north here. Um, and those are the regions that were not politically united, but were in many ways socially and religiously united by Ferdinand and Isabella, and I'll come back to that. And there's a question over here. Oh, okay, let me, um, I have a copy of my map. Yeah, you do need to use the table mics. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. <gasps> Good. Thank you. Okay. I know all you watching are enjoying me getting instruction on this while the class is going on, but there it goes. Okay, so uh, let me. Okay, this is a smaller version of the map, but we can still look at it. Mexico here, I'll do this, go over this again quickly. Mexico here, 
Mesoamerica here, Central America here, and then we've been... Okay, thank you. South America here with Brazil. Whoops. Brazil, Argentina, Chile, Peru, <laughs> Colombia, Venezuela, and then in the Caribbean, we have the island of Cuba. Here's the island of Hispaniola with Haiti and the Dominican Republic. And Puerto Rico is here. Clear? OK, good. OK, here's the peninsula of Iberia. Here's southern France, Portugal, would have been, the Kingdom of Portugal would have been roughly here. Then this is Spain today, and the Kingdom of Castile was much of the center of what is today Spain, and then the Kingdom of Aragon is here in the north. And those are the two regions, the two areas that Ferdinand and Isabella sought to unite, not necessarily politically, and I will talk about that later, but they united it in the sense of sharing projects of governance which brought those two areas together. Any questions about the maps? Okay. Yeah, sure. Can you, yeah. Um, I guess my question was, um, during uh, the colonization of South America or, or Latin America did um, were Aragon and the Kingdom of Aragon and Castile united yet or they were not um, by the time of the conquest of Mexico they had been they had been become united um, but Spain in its modern form still did not exist because there were still other independent kingdoms um, which were which were ruled by their own sovereigns, but there were increasingly united, united projects of governance, and the region, was beginning to, the region was beginning to come together. Can what I want to pick up with talking about now is is Iberia and some of its characteristics, especially the characteristics of Castile and Aragon. And this is in relation to the, the role of the Reconquest and the role that the Reconquest played in shaping the characteristics of the nation that will become Spain. And we, we finished up last week by talking about some of these characteristics of the Spain that is emerging in the late 15th and early 16th centuries. Uh, but I'll review the last points of uh, the lecture from last week and what we were going over, and then go on to, to finish this aspect of the history of Iberia and Spain, and then talk a little more specifically about Ferdinand and Isabella. Uh, and then we'll get into some of the other points that I'd like to cover today. So in terms of the reconquest and its impact on Spain, we talked about how one of the, one of the characteristics of the reconquest is it led to strong monarchs and strong institutions of central governance. And the reason for that, of course, is that warfare had 
the warfare had the effect of bringing people together and to be successful in war you need to have strong institutions of leadership and so since monarchies already existed the impact of the reconquest was to strengthen those particularly those where the Christian monarchs were successful the tendency towards urbanization also makes sense in terms of what's happening in Iberia at this time because there is a need for more fortification there is a need for more protection and of course people will gather together in order to take advantage of that and people gathering together helps create the economic and political conditions through which um, protective architecture and armies with which armies can function more effectively. So urbanization and the urbanization of Spain is also related to the reconquest. Another important aspect of the reconquest, and I think that we had talked about this last week, and I think in fact this was the point that we ended on, and this is the characteristic aspect of Spanish rule in Spain itself that is so important for the Spanish when they come into the New World, and that is that the Spanish have already had experience, an experience that they developed during the Reconquest with governing over ethnically and religiously different groups of people. So they are already used to dealing with Muslim populations and Jewish populations. These populations were, in terms of the overall Spanish population, they were smaller especially as we get into the 1592 period, and I'll give you some, some population figures in a little bit. But they were still, especially in the areas where they were concentrated, Muslims in the south, Jews in many of the major cities, especially in the areas where they were con concentrated, they did make up a l relatively large proportion of the population and certainly large enough so that these were groups that the, that the monarchs of the kingdoms of Spain had to deal with. And early in the reconquest period, although there are the battles of the reconquest taking place, once areas were conquered by Christian forces, the principle that the Spanish based their form of rule upon was this idea of conviviencia, living together or coexistence, as the term can also be translated. Conviviencia or coexistence was the cultural value that was very real in late medieval and Renaissance Spain that expressed the idea that communities and peoples of varying religious and ethnic traditions could live together in relative peace. If communities that had been conquered said that they would live peacefully and would pay taxes or tribute to a monarch, then the monarchs, especially the, the monarchs in the period before about 1400. Monarchs of that earlier period were pretty well disposed to let those groups of people carry on their own traditions. They did not force them to convert to Catholicism. And in the areas that had been conquered, Spain did achieve relative peace. It found methods that worked in terms of coexistence. And one of the really important aspects of that period, and one of the most important aspects of conviviencia, is the idea that Spain developed legal codes that talked about the kingdoms of Spain, especially the kingdom of Castile, developed legal codes that talked about how to deal with different and subjugated groups of people.
and that's very important and it is a point I'll also come back to later today. It's important because it helps us understand that when Spain went first into the Caribbean and then into the mainland areas, they weren't developing the institutions of governance out of thin air. They were using institutions they had already developed, in many cases changing them, and the institutions will change and develop over time in Latin America because in Latin America the circumstances, the cultures and the groups are very different. And they're not, they're not in Spain where the people with whom the Spanish are dealing uh, are groups that the Spanish themselves outnumber and surround and that demographic context creates a difference as well. But the most important point here is that the institutions that the Spanish will depend upon were institutions that already existed and that really come out of the Reconquest. So convivencia is very important. At the same time, and it's kind of odd to make this point because now it's going to sound like I'm making the exact opposite point, and you can ask me about that if I don't explain it clearly, but at the same time, over time, because of the, the military and religious pressures of the relationship between Catholic Spaniards and Muslim Spaniards and the growing conflict between them as the Reconquest goes on and the Catholic Spaniards are expanding their territory yet are frustrated that what they see as their territory, Iberia, uh, is still, still has regions that are controlled by Islamic rulers. Um, as that goes on, and this is also reinforced, of course, by events elsewhere in Europe and the Middle East, Catholic Castilians develop an increasingly real crusading spirit. That is, increasingly, they see it as important that the population of Iberia be united religiously. So that religious tolerance that is built into the concept and the laws relating to conviviencia begins to give way to much greater intolerance. I'll come back to the point of intolerance. What I'd like to emphasize about the crusading spirit now as I talk about the impact of the reconquest is that this aspect of the consequences of the reconquest is also very important not because it shows, not only because it shows the way that Spain joined in the crusading, Euro the crusading spirit of Western Europe of this time, but also because some of the practices and institutions relating to missionizing, relating to evangelization, relating to conversion, some of these institutions that are used in the Americas where priests do this incredible job of working with so many different people, speaking so many different languages, and implanting a new, a new religion. The institutions used by the Catholic Church, used by the priests, and relied on by the Spanish state, come back to this period of the Reconquest and grew out of the desire on the part of the monarchs of various kingdoms of Spain at this time to create kingdoms that were more religiously unified. So on the one hand, convivencia gives birth to a legal tradition and political traditions that are very useful as Spain moves into the Caribbean and then onto the mainland areas of Middle America and South America. On the other hand, as the crusading spirit gives way, as the spirit of conviviencia gives way to a, a crusading spirit, that form of Catholicism 
that says that people really do need to practice the same religion in order to unify these regions, that idea becomes very important as well because the institutions that develop out of that idea play a role within and beyond Spain. And the role that the church plays is a very, very important one. Another point, yes? Um, I was wondering what would you consider the most important factor or factors that led to, um, that led from the idea of convivencia to um, the Inquisition? Would you say, um, what, what led to such a big change um, and also if there are any specific dates? Should know. Okay, I will talk about the factors and some of the dates when I talk about Ferdinand and Isabella. But let me answer let me answer the question somewhat generally now, and then I'll provide a more specific answer after I talk about uh, the the rest of the points relating to the reconquest. I think that perhaps the most in, most important intervening factor, and this is in the mid and late 15th century has to do with Ferdinand and Isabella and their project of rule, which is not necessarily to unite the Iberian Peninsula politically because they're not yet thinking about forming the, the nation state of Spain. What they are thinking about is spreading a Catholic identity. And they see the spread of the identity as crucial to their joint project of governing. And then when, when the New World is discovered, once again, for a multitude of reasons, which I will try to come back to later on, later on today, but for a multitude of reasons, the church is placed in the position of playing an important role in creating the colony. It can't be the only colonizer because there are other kinds of power and other aspects of governance that are very important. But it, it does play a very important role. Though I would say that the role of the Americas I'm trying to think about how, how to say this because I want, I want to explain it carefully because I don't want to be heard to be undermining the sincerity of belief that priests and, and governing officials had uh, in relation to their ideas about Catholicism, which they believed in very sincerely. But I think that perhaps the main reason why religion is so important in the Americas is that there is no way that the Spanish can create a government that's powerful enough to deal with the vast region and millions of people that they encountered. And since they had already developed institutions like the Inquisition that were useful, though the, institu the Inquisition will not be the only religious institution that plays an important role. Because they had developed institutions that were useful, that were effective in Spain in creating a more religiously unified population, not that the institutions didn't uh, lead to certain kinds of conflict as well, those institutions will work well and were very adaptable to the, per to the purposes and for the circumstances that the Spanish found um, in, in the Americas. But before I talk about the institutions of governance, let me come back to the point about the importance of the reconquest. We've talked about strong monarchs, we've talked about urbanization, we've talked about conviviencia and its opposite, the crusading spirit. The last two consequences of the reconquest, which will be important for understanding the role of Spain in the 15th and 16th centuries, is The, first of all, this tremendously high value that the Spanish place on war. Now that seems almost, I think that seems almost as if it's, that's what I'm talking about. 
that's what the Reconquest is all about. And in a sense, that's true because the Reconquest is a series of battles and wars. But the point I want to make here in relation to the importance of war is that war is important and the military is important in part because war is a constant part of life that has these other consequences. But it's also important because this is a class-based society in which the position to which you are born is very important. It shapes a lot about your life. Mobility is hard. Social mobility is hard to achieve in a, monar in a monarchical and class-based society. And what becomes the primary means of mobility? The military. If you are successful in battle, if you are successful in warfare, if you uphold the cultural values placed on courage, endurance, and honor as part of warfare, as part of the military experience, then that may help you raise your position in society. This was true in the Reconquest. It is also true in the period of exploration and conquest in the Americas. Many of the men who accompanied the early explorers and conquerors had experience in Reconquest battles that had served as their military training. And they certainly saw coming to the Americas, participating in these events as a way of raising their status, as a pathway to wealth. Finally, the Reconquest had some important economic effects. One of the most important economic effects, and I think it's the one that I'll concentrate on here now, one of the most important economic effects of the Reconquest is that because the Reconquest went on for so long, the Reconquest undermined agriculture because fields were easy to destroy. fields and crops were easy to destroy. That meant that for the wealthy, investment in agriculture was highly problematic. That also meant that while farming was important and it was an activity, it was an economic activity in the Spain of this period, people weren't necessarily anxious to be farmers. And one of the most important economic activities that took the place of farming was actually ranching and the rearing of sheep. And sheep, not cattle, that are, that are important in Spain in this period. And why can, you, why can you raise sheep? And why are they valuable in this period? Well, you can raise them even under conditions of war because if you have to get away, you can move them, which isn't to say that they didn't become fought over at times. But they were more practical because it's a mobile, it's a mobile activity. So the rearing of animals, and in this case primarily sheep, was more practical. Sheep are valuable because textiles made of wool were valuable within and beyond Spain. And trading in textiles across Europe is growing greatly during this, during this period. Spain does gain some wealth from this economic activity. Nonetheless, it leads to some problems. The first one and most important economic problem that comes out of the Reconquest is that the Spanish, the kingdoms of Spain, cannot feed their own people. In the 15th century, the kingdoms of Spain had a population of roughly 10 million. So it's fairly large, populated 
region. The kingdoms of Spain cannot feed their own people. And so Spanish merchants have to trade wool for food. There were often food shortages. Food shortages led sometimes to riots. And there's a lot of economic instability in Spain in the 16th and 17th centuries. Even with the finding of the Americas and the wealth that that generated, in terms of the patterns of movement of the wealth, this did not help the Spanish to feed their own people. The other weakness is a weakness within Spain itself that will extend to the Americas, and that is that the Spanish don't like farming very much. They don't place a very heavy value on manual labor. That's a problem in Spain because of the need for food, as I've already mentioned, but it becomes a problem in colonial Latin America as well. Because one of the issues for the Spanish in Latin America is a very simple question, and that is, well, if we don't want to farm for ourselves, how are we going to feed ourselves? And that relates to the whole issue of the economic system that the Spanish develop and put in place. And I'll return to the, that issue of the economic system and labor, which is very important. I'll return to that issue later today. As a result of the reconquest, however, what we see with Spain in the 15th and early 16th centuries is that this is, this is a society that can administer diverse populations. It highly values military achievement and military skill. It's wealthy in land. It's wealthy in resources. Yet it also has certain economic weaknesses. And those economic weaknesses not only help to explain some aspects of the colonial project, they also help to explain why it is that Spain, by the late 16th century, with the largest empire in the world, will not remain the dominant colonial power for long. Be that as it may, what is important for us to understand right now is that, in a sense, the experience of the Reconquest and the way it shaped Spanish society, culture, and history before 1492, in a sense, pre-adapted Spain for the role that it will come to play in the Americas. In the mid-15th century, Ferdinand in Aragon and Isabella in the Kingdom of Castile become monarchs who will rule into the early 16th century. And who will play such an important role in the discovery of the Americas by Christopher Columbus. Ferdinand and Isabella were married in 1469. Isabella was not 
first in succession to the throne of Castile. But she took the throne with the support of many nobles and many towns and cities in Castile. And after taking the throne, Isabella in Castile and Ferdinand in Aragon, they set about to undertake joint projects of rule. But what is important to understand before I talk a little bit about the joint projects of rule and the way that they tried to reform and modernize their kingdoms, modernize in the 15th and 16th century sense of the, sense of the term, it is important to understand that their marriage contracts carefully subordinated each of them in the kingdom of the other. So that Ferdinand could not become the ruler of Castile, he was not the ruler of Castile, and Isabella was not the ruler of Aragon. Each of them ruled over their own kingdom. But their policies tended to be jointly carried out. They did have a close marriage, which didn't foreclose Ferdinand from engaging in some social projects, as monarchs seem want to do sometimes. But they did have a close marriage, and they had a close governing relationship. So many of their policies, as I've said, were jointly carried out. Because the policies were jointly carried out, this helped to give Spain an emergent national identity. But the kingdoms legally and politically did remain separate. What were their joint projects of governance? Well, there were several. The most important of which are, first of all, they were determined to curtail and control any institutions which they saw as threatening the central power of the monarchy. The church, town governments, the nobility. They wanted to make it clear that each of these institutions was to be under the power, either formally or informally, of the monarchs. That is, these were not to be centers of power that could in any way compete with them. In terms of the clergy, and the Catholic Church. Ferdinand and Isabella were contri contributors to the church, to the Pope in Rome, and in exchange for their contributions and also in celebration of the conquest of the Kingdom of Granada in 1492, which represented the end of the reconquest, the Catholic Church gave Ferdinand and Isabella certain rights of patronage to appoint priests, to appoint priests to high positions who were loyal to them. For those of you who have studied European history, you know that the relationship between church and state was fraught. in the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries. In Spain, in the 16th and 17th centuries in particular, the monarchy had a strong influence over the church, and the church played an important role after the reconquest was over in consolidating the role of Catholicism 
and the increasing unification of the Spanish population religiously. The church also played a very important role in the conversion project in the Americas. The ability to name priests to high positions was an important one that Ferdinand and Isabella used to forge a close relationship with the clergy, but a relationship that they could count on as serving their needs and their project of governance. In terms of the government itself, another important aspect of their rule was their tendency in every aspect of government, most especially the economy, but in a sense the economic realm is only one example of this tendency. Their tendency was to create councils, new councils, to which they would make the appointments. These councils and the men who served on them were educated. And they were new parts of the bureaucracy that was being created to manage the Spanish kingdoms in a more centralized and bureaucratic fashion. Councils will play an important role in the governance of the New World. But again, the idea was that the councils and their members were to be subordinate to the monarchs. And what the monarchs want from the councils is professional advice and information. But the councils are not to serve as centers of power. The councils are to be loyal, and they are subjugated. In terms of economic policy, economic policy is to be run in a centralized way. It is to be protectionist. That is, the idea of it is to control trade and the movement of goods in and out of Spain. Economic decisions are to be made in a way that does not allow for free trade or free competition. And the idea is that this will enhance the value of Spanish goods. The problem is that Spain is not wealthy enough in and of itself to support the high prices for goods that the monarchs desire. And this creates a variety of economic problems that I don't want to talk about now, but that will become important in understanding what happens to Spain and Spain's relationship with Latin America over time. In all ways, the interest of Isabella and Ferdinand is to enlarge, but at the same time protect their realm. The first way that they are challenged in terms of protecting their realm of course, relates to the Reconquest. The last great battles of the Reconquest were fought during their period of rule. The Christian armies were victorious. The last Muslim area, Granada, was conquered in 1492. And Ferdinand and Isabella have to decide how to rule over this large and very populated area. 
their emphasis is on harsher policies than those that had been the practice during the period of Convivencia. And in general, in terms of religion, they relied upon forced conversion as the means by which the Muslim population of Granada would be brought under Spanish Catholic rule. There were many successes that were part of Ferdinand and Isabella's rule. The ending of the Reconquest, the discovery of the Americas, were two of the most important. The modernizing of the government, in many ways, was also a success of their period of rule. But there were problems that accompanied their period of rule as well. One set of problems I think we can just sum up, I can just sum up by saying that there were a series of economic problems that they were never successful in dealing with. The ownership of land in the kingdoms of Spain was very concentrated. It was intensely concentrated. Figures suggest that in the kingdoms of Spain, in the 1490s, only about 3% of the population owned 95% of the land. That's pretty concentrated and pretty problematic. Because what that means is not only do you have this conflict between agriculture and sheep raising where sheep win out, which creates shortages of food, but you have a peasantry, a large peasant population in Spain, which is very poor. It can't feed itself. And many people, many, many people have a lot of difficulty supporting themselves. Given the fact that Spain of the late 15th and early 16th century is a relatively poor country, even with an enlarging realm. This means that the forms of proto-industrial development and trade that are being experienced in other parts of Europe, Spain cannot partake of those to the same extent. It will rely on the riches of the Americas to cover over these economic problems, but eventually even the riches of the Americas cannot overcome the poverty that exists within Spain and the inability of Spanish monarchs to do much about that. And I think there was a question. Um, yes, I was I wondered if you could repeat, you said Spain cannot um, participate in the... The proto-industrial development and the development of trade okay. that's taking place in the rest of Europe. Because merchants are, this is the period where merchants are emerging as a very important, <coughs> a very important force. Okay, so because you said that Spain was not a wealthy enough country to... Um, to have a closed economy. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it was not a wealthy enough country to have an open economy. It had a more, okay. it, it tried to have a closed economy. But what actually happened is that in trying to have a closed economy, what then emerges is a lot of illegal trade okay. and trade that's not under control. And that creates wealth that flows out because it can't be taxed okay. rather than creating wealth, a portion of which either comes in or stays in. Thank you. Okay. So there, there are a lot of economic problems. And there's all sorts of pressure. Because on the one hand, Spain is emerging as this, as what is a global power for that time. 
On the other hand, it has a large, very poor population that is religiously and ethnically divided. So in poor economic times, but times in which some people are profiting greatly, what can be the result of that? I've already said there are food shortages and riots. And given that there are deep religious differences which still exist in the period from the late 15th century and into the early 16th century, what, what can be a result of that? What can happen? And there's a crusading spirit where the idea of convivencia is, is pretty much gone. What about scapegoating? Is that is scapegoating sometimes a, a result of the kind of conditions that I'm talking about here? Well, scapegoating is sometimes a result. And what happens is that Muslim, Catholic, and Jewish groups, these people do not get along with each other very well. There's competition for food, there's competition for jobs. There's competition for positions in government. And what begins to happen is that there are, are increasing kinds of social conflicts. And some Catholic officials begin to believe that there is too much disunity, too much diversity or difference religiously. And they also begin to question the pace of conversion. Because I've already said that Ferdinand and Isabella decide that they are going to emphasize conversion rather than conviviencia at the end of the reconquest. But some officials, Catholic officials, decide that the pace of conversion is too slow. And what they want to do in order to force more conversion is to carry out forced baptisms, both of children and of others in the population as well. Forced conversions and forced baptisms led to riots and revolts. And in 1502, Isabella decreed in Castile that the Muslim population of the kingdom had to choose between baptism and exile. Many did choose to convert, but many chose to leave. In this period, Granada, the Kingdom of Granada, had a population of about 500,000. About 100,000 of those were killed or enslaved as part of the end of the Wars of the Reconquest. About 200,000 left and about 200,000 converted. So that's quite a large number. But the problem with the conversions the problem with those who converted and the problem for those who converted was that Catholics, Catholics increasingly came to believe, as they will about the Jewish population as well, Catholics increasingly came to believe that the conversions weren't true, that they were only on the surface, that they weren't a true and deep experience. So the idea is that the monarchs are saying, we force you to convert, but we don't really believe in the conversion that you have taken part in. And this same set of ideas and experiences happened with the Jewish population as well. The Jewish population was smaller. In Castile, it, the Jewish population numbered between uh, two and 300, the total number was between two and three hundred thousand. In 1492, they were given the choice 
of conversion or exile. So this actually happened first with the Jewish population, then 10 years later with the Muslim population. The Jews who converted were known as conversos. And again, the conversos were faced with this dilemma of Catholics saying, we are forcing you to convert, but we don't really believe that you have fully converted. So that this led to a number of problems. One, it meant that the people who had made the decision to convert were always under suspicion. And the thing I think we have to realize is that when you convert by force, even if you make the choice sincerely, if you're an adult converting, unless you change everything about how you view the world, it's very difficult to take on a wholly new belief system and practice it perfectly and have it permeate your total being because you've been raised another way. It's like learning a language. It's like anything that's deeply a part of you. How are you going to change that almost overnight, no matter how sincere you are? That's, that's a very hard thing to do. So it creates all sorts of problems in daily life for people who undergo this forced conversion experience. And then oftentimes we know also that when we're forced to do something, even if we know or we think we should do it, it's not, it's not easy to make yourself do it because we, we respond to that, people respond to that negatively. Sure. Um, you had stated earlier that because um, the Reconquest gave them um, sort of these institutions in which they could later imply or put in, in the Americas, when they were doing this, when Ferdinand and Isabella decide that they're going to convert people in their own country, in their own kingdoms by force, and this is the result of what, what's happening, you know, increasing uh, social conflicts, why do they do that in the Americas as well? Is it because it was just part of what they knew? In part, in large part, it's because it's what they knew, what they believed to be right. And they believed that, in fact, they believed that they had been rewarded for the reconquest and for their efforts to create a unified to create a nation that was unified religiously, even if it wasn't unified politically, they believed that the finding of the Americas was a reward for that. And therefore, the same activities that they were carrying out in Spain were appropriate to carry out in the Americas. They believed that you had to be Catholic. And they, but they also believed that becoming Catholic was part of the project of colonizing the region that it wasn't possible to rule it without the population converting. The, the two went hand in hand. Also, and I will talk about this, uh, again, I'll, I'll come back to this point later today, that the go there was a practical element to this as well that I alluded to earlier. That is, the, there could never be enough bureaucrats given the very large populations that existed in the core areas of, of the Americas and of, of what becomes Latin America. And therefore, there is a certain sense in which the, the, the state needed the church to play a certain role. And because it's been so effective in developing a sort of partnership with the church in which the monarchy is the senior partner, they feel that that relationship will, will work successfully in Mexico and in Peru, which become the centers of population in, in the New World. Yeah. Um, also, Chastine makes a point in the book that a lot of the 
conquistadors and colonizers actually thought that they were um, doing the enslaved Africans and the indigenous people a favor mm -hmm. by converting mm -hmm. them and mm -hmm. bringing Absolutely. them to the Absolutely. light of Christianity. So it was, I guess, the conviction of religious uh, righteousness mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. they, they thought it was their duty and that even if they were enslaving them to convert them and force them to work, that it was justified. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I like the phrase religious righteousness because many of the Spaniards who come to the New World and participate in the conquest absolutely carry th that idea. Sometimes the conquest is referred to with the following terms, it's the search for uh, God, gold, and glory. And to use the, the word God there is to imply this idea that it's the search for um, spreading Catholicism to, um, to these people who haven't experienced, and many who haven't experienced, and many of the people participating in the conquest, many of the men participating in the conquest, really do think of it as a sort of gift. Giving the gift raises many, many issues, though, that have to do with the implantation of colonial rule, which is something that we'll talk about at greater length. But before we get to, before we get to that point, we need to finish up talking about Iberia by talking briefly about the role of the Inquisition. Uh, and then we'll be able to talk about the Aztecs, the conquests, and the institutions of colonial rule. But in terms of the Inquisition, there are only a few points about that that I'd like to make, and that is that the term Inquisition is sometimes a term that is misunderstood. The term Inquisition refers to special religious courts which are designed to root out heresy. As the courts of the Inquisition developed in Spain, and this was an institution that developed over time in the 14th and 15th centuries, the courts of the Inquisition developed first to scrutinize those of Jewish heritage who had converted to Christianity. These people were known as conversos. And the belief was common that conversos often secretly practiced Jewish rituals and ceremonies and held to Jewish religious beliefs. In 1492, when Ferdinand and Isabella signed edicts expelling those Jews who did not convert, about 250,000 left and 50,000 remained. The 50,000 who remained were subject to a great deal of scrutiny because of this distrust of their conversion. They were often denounced secretly. Individuals were denounced secretly to the Inquisition courts. They were then investigated. They had little opportunity to answer or to provide evidence for themselves. They were punished harshly, often physically punished. Some would die, some were executed, but many others would die in the harsh conditions of imprisonment that they had to endure. 
The Inquisition is an institution that came under scrutiny at the time and ever after. It's seen as a unique symbol of Spanish intolerance. It certainly is an example of intolerance. But what's most important about the Inquisition and about this aspect, the religious aspect of Ferdinand and Isabella's rule, is that Ferdinand and Isabella, however personally tolerant they actually were, because there's plenty of evidence to suggest that on a personal level they were tolerant, they used intolerance and they made use of and believed in the crusading spirit of Catholicism and Christianity to forge a national identity that was centered not on a political definition of the nation state, but on a cultural and religious definition of Spanish identity. That notion of religious identity as fundamentally connected to cultural identity is one that will have many implications and many consequences in Latin America. Latin America may be religiously diverse today and it may be overstating it to see it as 100% completely Catholic at any point in the past. But there is little doubt that Catholicism played a key role historically, both in the colonial period and later on, as Catholic beliefs were very important in the shaping of cultural and political traditions in Latin America. So Catholicism and the way that it came into Latin America is crucial for understanding Latin American society, culture, and history, both past and present. The Spaniards, as Professor Kuntz talked about in his lecture last week, once they discovered the Americas, the Spanish came into regions which were populated, and not only which were populated, but which in some areas were populated by groups and societies that were themselves highly developed. And what I want to talk about and introduce now is to talk about Aztec culture. What was it like? We talked a little bit about that last week, but we didn't get to it in much detail. What was it like? And more importantly, how was it similar to or different from Spanish and Iberian culture? Because I think that helps us understand the encounter and the conquest in greater detail. And I think there was a question. Yeah, <coughs> I have a, a little bit of a confusion. Sure. Um, the Spanish, uh, they're occupying Castillo and Aragon so far, and that's... Well, Castile and Aragon are in Iberia, and those are the constituent kingdoms of what will become the nation of Spain. Okay. And it's, it's... But when you refer to the Spanish, you're referring to those two Primarily those, two, primarily those two kingdoms, though there were people from other regions who begin to participate, of Spain, who begin to, what becomes Spain, yeah. who but begin so to participate so in the conquest. so far where we are. Yeah, well, um, as, as the Spanish come into the Americas, they are primarily people from those, from those two kingdoms, especially oh. the southern part of Castile. Okay. Historians use the term Spanish because it's inconvenient to keep referring to Castilians and others. 
So they use the term Spanish, but the nation Spain doesn't really exist at this time. So when historians talk about Spain, it's, it's a shorthand for talking about people primarily from those two, primarily from those two kingdoms. But what I want to turn to now is to talk about the Aztecs. And the point I want to make is that the term Aztec is a big term that can refer to all the people who spoke the who spoke the Nahuatl language in the late 15th and early 16th century in the Valley of Mexico. But it also can be used to refer to a smaller group that were at the center of the Aztec Empire. And I'll pick up with that after the break.
Okay, we are back, and I do want to say that I hope I've gotten all my technological disasters out of my system, though I doubt it. But what I'd like to pick up with now is to talk about the Aztecs. I'd like to talk briefly about their culture and society. And as I said before, try to explain both what some of their differences are from the Spanish, but also some of the similarities because both play a role in helping us, both can play a, a role in helping us to understand how the conquests played out as we come back to the question of why the conquests succeeded at all. Because if we remember that Tenochtitlan in 1519, when the Spanish arrived, had a population of perhaps about 250,000, we can only make estimates, but that is thought by most archaeologists to be a pretty good estimate. If it had a population of 250,000, how do we explain that about 600 Spanish soldiers succeeded in conquering it? Not only did they conquer it, but they then kept it and built their own capital city, what is today Mexico City, on top of it. This is pretty amazing, which is not to say that it's necessarily good, but it is a feat, a military feat and achievement that does inherently force us to ask the question of why. Why were the Spanish able to carry out this conquest? But before we talk about that, first we need to talk about the Aztecs themselves. And as you can see, now that I've mastered this pen, um, as you can see here on this um, nice computer pad that I can write on, uh, and as I started to say before, the term Aztec has a number of meanings. It's a pretty broad term. It can refer to all those people in the center of Mexico who in the late pre-Hispanic period spoke the language Nahuatl, N-A-H-U-A-T-L. And that's many people. That's millions of people. These are the people, Nahuatl speakers populated the Valley of Mexico and beyond during the post-classic period and especially the late post-classic period. Dr. Kuntz talked about the chronology uh, as I did as well, but he did not get much in detail into the cultures of the later period. So the term Aztec can refer to all those people who were Nahuatl speaking people of the Valley of Mexico and beyond in the period prior to 1519. The term Aztec can also refer to those groups that allied together constituted the ruling powers of the Aztec Empire. The Aztec Empire by 1519 spanned much, though not quite all, of Mesoamerica. And the empire is also sometimes known as the Triple Alliance. If any of you have read um, about the Aztecs, you may have seen the term Triple Alliance. And the reason for the term Triple Alliance is that the empire was ruled by three groups in three cities that had allied themselves together in order to begin a project of conquest and expansion. They had begun that project early in the 14th century and in 1519 they had put together quite a large empire. The most important group in the Triple Alliance was a group known as the Mexica. And you can see as you look at this term Mexica that this is the term from which the modern nation of Mexico takes its name. It takes its name from this group of people. And X in the Nahuatl language usually is pronounced like we pronounce an SH. So Mexica is the, is the correct pronunciation. The capital city of the Mexica 
which underlies Mexico City today, was the city of Tenochtitlan. So Tenochtitlan was the capital city of the Aztecs, or more properly, the Mexica. And Mexica is the term that I will tend to use today because that's the specific group that I am talking about. Mexica legends emphasize that they were a small group from somewhere in the north coming from a region known as Aztlan, and there's lots of discussion about where Aztlan was or is, and who came, this group came out of a group of caves known as Chicamostoc in the region of Aztlan. They wandered around, and in their wanderings around, they moved south, and in 1325, they founded their capital city of Tenochtitlan. Tenochtitlan was an island that lay in the center of a large lake system. And why did they, why did they uh, start and develop their capital city there? Because their god, one of their gods, perhaps their most important god in this early period, told them to look for a sign. And if you think about the flag of Mexico, you probably actually know what the sign is. The sign was an eagle perched on a cactus. And once they saw that sign, that sign, seeing that sign would tell them where to settle, and so they did. In the 1420s, as a result of a series of conquests of the groups that ruled over them, the Mexica allied themselves with two other groups and set off on their own lengthy series of conquests, which helped them to create an empire. So they were an imperial power, and their society and culture have a number of characteristics that are important for us to consider. One is that, like the Spanish, the Mexica were very warlike. War and warriors were praised highly. Soldiers played important roles. And this was also a class stratified society in which there were not many ways to move to the top. And war and the military was, again, the primary means to do so if you were not born into the elite or noble class. Their culture was centered around religion, <coughs> philosophy, a strong belief in their own history, which they remembered through an oral culture of songs and poems, Though they also had a relatively simple form of writing, not as well developed as the Maya hieroglyphic writing that Professor Kuntz talked about, but they did have a form of writing and they did use it to keep economic records and to record historical events. But in terms of their culture, what I'd really like to emphasize right now is the importance of their religion. Just as Catholicism was at the center of life for Castilians and for the Spanish in the early 16th century, the religion of the Mexica, the religion of the Aztecs more generally, and in many ways the religion of Mesoamerican peoples more generally, because while there were regional differences in religious practices and in the concepts of deities, there were many beliefs and practices that were shared in common across the broad region of Mesoamerica. Religion in Meso Mesoamerica was a very important part of life. <coughs> 
the religious calendar was omnipresent. One of my professors long ago in graduate school used to say, you couldn't turn around without running into another ceremony. There was a ceremony every day. And there were ceremonies for many different, many different aspects of life. Uh, so it was a very ceremonial religion, and it had a very crowded, busy religious calendar. And religious ceremony took place at all levels, from the individual and the home, to the neighborhood, to the town or city, to the state. There were many deities. The deities are complicated. This isn't the place to talk to or to go into a lot of detail about the deities, except to say that the deities do cluster. And the deities are associated with certain kinds of themes, beliefs, and ceremonies. And one set of deities, of course, had to do with rain, with agriculture, and with fertility. And among these deities, many of these deities are female. That is, the primary uh, de deities who were women were found in the set of deities who have to do with agriculture, fertility, and rain. Another set of deities have to do with celestial creation and creativity. Some of these deities are male, a few of them are female, but many of them, the important ones, either are bi-gendered or don't have a gender at all. Because these deities have to do with cosmic beliefs about the origins of the universe, the origins of the earth, the origins of Mesoamerican peoples. Then a third set of deities has to do with war and nourishment of the sun and earth through war, blood, and sacrifice. Many of these deities were male, though some of them do have either female counterparts or there again are some that are female. For the Spanish, and for many people who read about the Mexica and the Aztecs today, human sacrifice is considered the most notorious feature of their religious practices. Many Native American groups did practice some human sacrifice, but the Aztecs were the group that carried it to the greatest extreme. Even though they carried it to an extreme, it also is important, however, to put it somewhat in context. That is, the practice of human sacrifice was not, was, it wasn't carried out in random ways. It was part of a belief system, which isn't to say that those who were sacrificed, even if they believed in the deities and, and held many of the same beliefs. This is not to say that those who were sacrificed uh, enjoyed the opportunity, because most likely they didn't, and that's why they often had to be drugged in order for the sacrifice to be carried out. But the point I want to emphasize here is that sacrifice was part of a belief system. And the most important aspect of the belief system for understanding the practice of sacrifice is that as we notice ourselves, ourselves, the sun seems to move each day from east to west. And the Aztecs believed that the sun, in order to take that journey every day, and in order to take the journey that was necessary for the seasons of the year and for agricultural fertility, to be successful, that the sun had to be fed, the sun had to be nourished. And you have to give to the sun what is most precious to you. So their belief was that in giving human life and in giving blood and hearts, 
that they were giving the sun what was precious to them. This is also connected to the idea that for them, life and death were connected. You have to have death in order to have life. And in some ways, that idea is related to agriculture. If you're going to have new crops, the old ones have to be harvested. So that there's a cycle to everything. And this notion of cycle, this notion of a, a crucial tie, a close tie, between life and death is critical to their belief and practice. They saw war and sacrifice as divinely sanctioned. And I think it's fair to say that although the conquests that were part of creating the Aztec Empire were definitely carried out in order to create economic ties and to allow the flow of goods into the main central markets into Nochtitlan and the other major cities. There's no doubt that the conquests were also carried out, the conquests by the Aztec Empire over other Mesoamerican peoples. There's no doubt that those conquests were carried out for religious beliefs, that it was divinely sanctioned to practice war, to capture soldiers in battle, and that those captives could and would be sacrificed. There are many differences between the Spanish and the Mexica. The Spanish had a much more developed writing system. They had greater knowledge of world geography. They had a more sophisticated system of governance, although the system of governance of the Aztecs and of the Inca, these systems of governance were also fairly sophisticated, but I think it's fair to say that the Spanish system was more sophisticated. But both peoples saw their war practices as divinely sanctioned. But there's also a critical difference in the ways that they practiced war. Because the Spanish fought to kill, and the Aztecs fought primarily to obtain captives. There are some other differences relating to the military that are also important. Of course, the main one that I'm thinking of has to do with technology. I can come back to that. I can come back, back to that point. For now, I want to stress the idea that this was a complex culture with many different cultural characteristics, but that a strong sense of religion was a critical part of the culture and that religion played this very important role in terms of the ceremony of everyday life and it was related in important ways to the political system and to the creation and development of the empire. Also part of Mexica and Aztec society is the fact that there is a complex developed economy throughout especially the Valley of Mexico but beyond as well. 
Cities have markets. Cortez left a very famous description of the largest market in Mexico City, what became Mexico City, and he talks about 60,000 souls trading daily in that market. Now, 60,000 could well be an exaggeration, not impossible if you read Cortez's writing to think that sometimes he exaggerated, but whether it's 60,000, 30,000, or 20,000, we're talking about thousands of people in a very huge market. A market in which goods from all parts of the empire were available, and goods came into that market and other markets as well through both trade. Merchants are very important, and the merchant group is growing, growing in status. And the merchants carry out, the highest status merchants carry out long distance trade. Mer merchants were also crucial in actually designating some of the areas that the empire would then go on to conquer and bring into and make part of the empire. In addition to trade, Tribute was also important. Conquered areas had to pay tribute, and they were forced to pay tribute in goods that were valuable, that the Mexica and the other ruling groups of the empire desired. I'll also point out that, like the Mexica, the population of the Valley of Mexico was quite large. There is disagreement about the population of central Mexico in 1519, that is on the eve of conquest. Some people would argue that the population of the valley and surrounding regions could have been as high as about 12 million. There are even figures beyond 12 million, but I think it's likely that those figures are too high. But if we're talking about a population of 12 million in the central region, millions of people in the Valley of Mexico, this huge capital city in the very, at the very center of the valley with the city alone with a population of 250,000, we really are forced to ask this question about the conquest and how anybody could carry this out. The last characteristic of the Aztecs I want to briefly mention is that they had a very strict and rigid legal code. Some of the basic laws of their legal code have to do with drinking, adultery, and stealing. And the basic idea is don't do any of them. Those behaviors, drinking, adultery, and stealing, could be capital crimes. In other words, you could be put to death for any of those. In fact, when the Mexica and others became literate in, well, it's a very interesting, this is something I, I want to note right now because it will get mentioned um, from time to time. After the conquest, some of the indigenous, some people within the different indigenous groups became literate in the sense that there were already scribes who could write in the system of writing that already existed. But as I said, it was, very, it was a very simple writing system. Some of these individuals, however, learned Spanish and Latin. And what they did was, some of them, many of them uh, did become bilingual. But what they did was they adopted the alphabet, the Roman alphabet, to their language to the language of Nahuatl. And so in the 16th century, into the present day, Nahuatl became a written language in our sense, in the sense, in, in a way that it hadn't been previously. 
and documents in Nahuatl using the Roman alphabet began to be produced. And those documents, we, for people who are fluent in Nahuatl, those documents can still be read today. They can be read and translated. And they're a tremendous historical source because they give us something of a native view of, of many different aspects of life during the colonial period. But what I want to point to here is that in some of these Nahuatl accounts of the early period, right after the conquest, they talk about how lax the Spanish are. They think the Spanish, that their own moral standards are very lax. And that what the Spanish have succeeded in doing is creating chaos. And that in the old time, that those were the golden times. Those were the times when everything was in order and people knew how to behave and everything was done, everything was done right. And the Spanish who are always writing about their own morality and how upstanding they are and that they are the ones who are bringing morality to the Americas and to the peoples of the Americas, it's very interesting to see that the people of the Americas sometimes voice a different, a different op opinion. So what you have coming together as the Spanish come into first the Caribbean and then into the mainland areas and encounter indigenous groups who are large, who are characterized by the existence of class structures, imperial, an imperial system of power, who have complex economic practices, who are developed and have many military skills, and who have their own legal code and their own very strong sense of and ways of doing things. You have groups coming together that for all their differences in language and other cultural practices are similar in a variety of important ways. So what happens as these groups come together? What happens, of course, is first a period of exploration But in addition to the period of exploration, which occurs from 1492 on, as Spaniards begin to sail from the Caribbean islands in and around the Gulf of Mexico, What happens during that period, in addition to exploration, is that the Spaniards import as well as develop a style of rule that will allow them ultimately to successfully implant many of their institutions among the Aztecs, among the Inca, and once they conquer those groups and situate themselves in the heart, in the heartland regions, let me say, of the two largest empires. They then have given themselves a base from which they will go on to explore and conquer much of what becomes Latin America. Before talking about how they colonize and rule, we need to talk about the conquest. And we will talk about, as the example of conquest, we will talk about the conquest of the Aztecs. But first, there's a question. <laughs> 
Yes, I was wondering if, um, when comparing the Spanish and the Aztecs, as far as um, being empires and using religion as mm -hmm. uh, justification of subjugating peoples, um, did the Aztecs try to enforce their religion on the people that they conquered, or was it more of just an economic um, empire instead of, or, or were there even various religions that existed within the Aztec Empire? As I said, there were, there was a basic stratum of belief that was similar, broadly similar across Mesoamerica. Uh, some of the difference that existed had simply to do with languages. That is, many of the deities that existed were actually the same deities, but they have different names, and they may be drawn in some, or drawn or sculpted in somewhat different form. But there, many of the same deities existed across the region. What happened religiously in in the within the Aztec Empire? was not that they tried to force their religion because the religion was largely the same. What they would do was burn down the main temple and the, uh, an image of a burning temple was a sign of conquest, a, a symbol of conquest. They would burn the main temple in a community or city that they were conquering and they would institute their own primary deities as the primary deities in that region because different areas and communities worshipped as the main deities of that area identified with the, with the main deities, identified as the main deities, different deities. But they come out of the same complex of deities. But a different deity or deities could be more important in one area or another. So I hope that makes sense. But that's the extent to which they really focused on religious change, in part because there isn't a whole religion to change. But they also do not particularly emphasize social or cultural change as part of their project of imperial rule. And that is a difference between them. But those groups that they conquered were certainly, those groups that they conquered were certainly very aware, very conscious of their subjugation to the extent that the imperial structure is actually something that Cortez will make use of as he, as he carries out his conquests. The Mexica ruler, the supreme ruler, or the word for supreme ruler is Tlatoani. The supreme ruler or Tlatoani of the Mexica in the period when Hernan Cortez and his followers came into the Valley of Mexico, and I'll talk about how they got there in a minute. The Mexica ruler in this period, and his name, you may see it in many different versions, and I give you no guarantee that this is the correct one. In fact, it probably isn't the correct one, but it's the simplest one for me to say and write. And it comes pretty close to how it may have been pronounced uh, in the period in which he was alive. Uh, the main ruler of the Mexica in this period is Moctezuma. And okay. I'll come back to the name Malin scene, but the leader of the Spanish, as you no doubt know. The conqueror of the Aztecs is Hernan Cortes. Cortes, however, was not the first explorer to try to explore the mainland of what will become Mexico. Spanish settlers in the Caribbean, particularly on the island of Cuba, had grown 
somewhat bored and dissatisfied with the situation in Cuba because they wanted to go in search of greater wealth, which may have been the result of rumors floating around about the mainland and that there was great wealth to be found on the mainland. The governor of Cuba, a man by the name of Diego Velazquez, thought that further exploration was a good idea and he gave permission for two expeditions of exploration which sailed around the southern part of the Gulf Coast, particularly around the Yucatan Peninsula, part of what today is Mexico. As part of these expeditions, Spaniards did go on shore. They didn't stay very long. They did go on shore, and they had some brief encounters and interactions with the Maya. But the Maya were very anxious to keep the Spanish out of their region and so what they did was say, oh, you aren't really interested in us, we're poor. You want to go to the west where there's a large great city and a lot of wealth and that's really where you should go. And I'm oversimplifying this account somewhat, but basically it's, what I'm arguing is, is a little bit oversimplified, but is, is basically what happened. And the Maya did succeed in um, communicating the idea that it really would be wet, better to go to the West because there were people there who would fit the purpose of the Spanish better. Because I guess the Maya sort of figured out what the Spanish were, were interested in. So Velazquez... Uh, decided to allow a third expedition, which would be an expedition of both exploration and trade. He did not specifically empower this third expedition with the right to conquer. This expedition, for this expedition, he named as leader Hernan Cortez, but Velazquez got very worried about what Cortez was going to do because as Cortez would then go on to show he was a rather strong and willful person and Velazquez actually tried to take back his orders from Cortez but Cortez got got wind of this and decided to set off on his expedition while he still had the orders and while he was uh, in a sense ahead of the game and he set out early in 1519. Cortez had been, bo had been born in Spain to a noble family, one that had fallen on hard times, but he had both some military experience and he also had education. He was a pretty rough person, but he was educated, he could write, and, as will prove important in the process of conquest, he had some legal training. He was not a lawyer. He didn't finish his course of study. But he had some legal training, and it will turn out that he can use some of that training. He could put some of that training to good use during the process of conquest. So what I want to talk about are the phases of conquest because I could try to narrate the conquest as a seamless whole, but I think it's really a lot easier to understand it in three phases. Three phases that help explain why ultimately the Spanish were able to be successful. Cortez and his soldiers, who numbered about 600, landed on the Gulf Coast in 1519. 
and this is the beginning of the first phase. What's important about the first phase is that the Spanish march westward, and during that march, through a combination of diplomacy and terror, the, the Spanish succeed in gaining a large number of allied native soldiers. But before they start marching west, which is really the key process during the first phase, before they start marching west, the Spanish do something else. Cortez knows that the governor of Cuba, Diego Velazquez, he knows very well that Velazquez did not want him to carry out a conquest, and he knows very well that he has no orders from the governor or from the ruling monarch of Spain. But he knows also that if he is to get credit for what he hopes will be his conquest, he has to legitimize the conquest in some way. So what he does is he and his men found the town which they named at this time the Via Rica de la Vera Cruz, the rich or wealthy town of the True Cross. And that was the basis for what is today the city of Veracruz on the southern Gulf Coast of Mexico. The founding of this town was critical because it gave Cortez and his men a base. And if you found a town in Spanish, in the Spanish political system, if you found a town, you have to have a town government. You can't have one without the other. Cortez then resigns his position of leadership and has the men elect a city council, also known as the Cabildo, which is a term um, some of you may be familiar with. A Cabildo is a, a town or city council. He has his men elect this town council. And you may be surprised to know that after the election of the council, the council then selected Cortez as the leader who will serve as the chief military and judicial officer of the town and who will lead the expedition in its march to the west. And that's one of the ways in which Cortez's legal training came in handy because he understood not only that he had to legitimize himself, but he understood the way that he could do so. I'm sure that was a very free election when the Cabildo was elected and when the Cabildo voted to name Cortez as the chief military and judicial officer. Cortez and his men had also already realized in this period that some of the people and groups to the west of the Maya did not speak a Maya language. Maya actually isn't a single language. It's uh, made up of many different, though related, languages. But Cortez noticed that there were other non-Maya languages spoken by some of the groups he and his men were beginning to encounter. And he knew that he had a translation issue and he understood that translation was critical to his undertaking. That without translation and without effective communication, it would be very difficult, if not impossible, to carry out the conquest that he wanted to carry out. And so he got translators. 
in this first phase, he had to rely on two translators, one of whom went on to become very famous. This is the woman who is known in the literature, perhaps most prominently by the term or name Malinche. She's also known as Doña Marina. And in the most contemporary literature, she is usually known by the name Malinche. Malinche will become the main translator for the Spanish. But in this first stage, she was not because she didn't yet know Spanish. She knew two languages, though. She knew Nahuatl, and she spoke the main Maya language of the Yucatan Peninsula, Yucatec Maya. So that helped, that would help to translate between the two native languages in the region, but didn't help translate anything into Spanish. So what Cortez has to do is he's forced to rely on a, train, on, a, on a chain of translators. First in the chain is actually a Spaniard named Jeronimo Aguilar. Aguilar had been on an expedition, an earlier expedition, sailing around the Gulf Coast. Uh, his ship had gone down, and he had been shipwrecked and had gone onto the Yucatan Peninsula had been adopted into a Maya group where he lived and he had become fluent in the Maya language, but he had never given up hope of being found by the Spanish. And somehow when Cortez's expedition arrived, he found out about the arrival of the ex expedition and he went to meet the Spanish. So Aguilar speaks Spanish and Maya. Doña Marina speaks Maya and Nahuatl. So she translates at first the way the chain goes as they march west and get into the Nahuatl speaking region. She translates from Nahuatl to Maya. Aguilar translates from Maya to Spanish. So it's a somewhat bulky or impractical chain of translation that has to go on. But for a time, this is the way translation took place. Eventually, she learns to speak Spanish. And by the next year, by 1520, Malintzin will serve as the primary translator. But Aguilar hangs around for much of this first period. And Aguilar and Malintzin work together to translate for the Spanish. And what are they translating? Well, as the Spanish move through community after community, They are translating between Cortes and rulers and nobles of the different towns and cities. And they're basically translating either an offer of friendship and alliance or a threat of war. And sometimes communities take up the offer of a friendly alliance Sometimes they fight back. Many battles were fought in the course of this stage. Many people, especially many natives, were killed. Cortez and his soldiers, because they were so outnumbered, often used what what I think many of us would consider to be tactics of terror, either torture or grave physical punishment that could result in death in order to persuade the armies and their leaders that it was better to ally with the Spanish. And the Spanish were very persuasive, in part because the technique of fear that they used was successful, but also because many of the groups that were subjugated to the Aztecs didn't like them too much. And they thought, well, 
maybe it'll be better to ally themselves with the Spanish. Maybe I'll ally myself with the Spanish, and then when they conquer the Aztecs, I'll be able to tell the Spanish what to do, and I'll be in a good position. I think that was the thinking of many native rulers, that they would make use of the Spanish for their own purposes. They didn't know that it wasn't going to turn out that way, but as they're making decisions about what to do, I think that's not, that was not an unreasonable or irrational, that was neither unreasonable nor irrational as a way to think about what was, what was taking place. Cortez succeeded in creating a large allied army of soldiers, one that may have numbered as large as 20,000 men. The first stage finishes with the Spanish coming into the Valley of Mexico, seeing from outside of it, seeing the city of Tenochtitlan and being just utterly amazed. Spanish accounts talk about how beautiful the city was, how the Spanish couldn't believe the sight of it. Not only was it an island in the center of a lake, the water was very blue. The Mexica put limestone on their buildings, so many of their uh, temples were white, and then they were painted, so they were very dramatic looking. Many buildings were decorated. The city was uh, traversed or crossed by canals. So it was like, like Venice and people, well, they didn't use gondolas, they used canoes, but it was very common that people and goods were moved around in canoes. And it was very orderly, it was very organized. This was a society that had a pretty strict behavioral and legal code, as, as already mentioned. So the first phase ends with the Spanish seeing Tenochtitlan, and the second phase begins in November of 1519 with the Spanish entering Tenochtitlan, recording their amazement. And it begins also with a meeting on one of the bridges from the mainland into Tenochtitlan begins with a meeting between Cortez and Moctezuma. Cortez and Moctezuma exchange gifts. And they each give a speech about how wonderful it is to meet the other. And Moctezuma says that the Mexica will be welcoming of these guests. And Cortez says, we will be very good visitors and guests. And shortly thereafter, Cortez takes Moctezuma prisoner. This is often mentioned as an example of Cortez's uh, strategic genius. But in fact, this was a very common reconquest practice of war for Castilian Christian armies to capture Islamic rulers because it was believed to be devastating to the governing practices in a community or a region. For the Aztecs, this was particularly devastating. It was a particularly serious and dramatic act. The Mexica did not believe that their rulers were deities, but they did believe that their rulers had close connections to deities and that their rulers were like deities. Rulers were a form of supreme human being. They were seen as human, but they were a form of supreme human being different from everybody else. And they were owed a kind of deference, and this was a very deferential society in which all forms of hierarchy were connected to practices of deference. But the Tlatoani, 
was, he wasn't just of the higher class and of the nobility. He was a person apart. So when he was captured, imprisoned in a palace, and while treated res respectfully by the Spanish, never allowed any kind of freedom again, the capture did lead to a political crisis among the Aztecs. The Aztec leaders, the Mexica leaders, and the leaders of the empire were angered, and they were very shocked by what had been a very easy capture with little resistance offered. So that's what takes place at the beginning of the second stage. But the second stage becomes complicated because just as Cortez carries out this act, which if not an act of strategic genius, was nonetheless crucial, absolutely crucial to the conquest, instead of consolidating that achievement, Cortez leaves Tenochtitlan. He leaves many of his soldiers under the leadership of one of his close lieutenants, a man named Pedro, Pedro de Alvarado. He leaves Tenochtitlan to go face off with soldiers who have been sent by the governor of Cuba, who by now is aware and darn unhappy with Cortez and what he is doing. So the governor of Cuba has sent soldiers to capture and imprison Cortez. Cortez goes off to deal with this problem. And he goes off to Veracruz. He and his men fight with the men who've come from Cuba. They win the fight. They actually imprison the leader of that expedition. And many of the men who had come with the leader of that expedition, a man named Panfilo de Narvaez, many of Narvaez's men then join with Cortez. So Cortez beefs up his forces some um, through, this, through this set of events. The problem is that while he is out of Tenochtitlan, disaster takes place. Alvarado was very, Alvarado was very dedicated to the cause of conquest. He was very tough. He really believed in confrontation. But it also seems to be the case that, and he, Alvarado could be very cruel, but it also seems to be the case that Alvarado got very nervous after Cortez was gone because he began to believe, and it may well have been true, he began to believe that Mexica nobles were meeting to try and overthrow the Spanish. So what happens is that Alvarado allows an important Mexica ceremony to take place at one of the main pyramids in the main uh, ceremonial center of Tenochtitlan. He allows this ceremony to take place. Many of the uh, cities and the Mexica leadership were at the ceremony, and Alvarado and the other Spanish soldiers attack. They kill many of the leaders. Many of them are killed. Many of them are wounded. And it's right at that point that Cortez and his men come back into the city. And they come back into chaos because once this killing has taken place, the Mexica population is enraged. And they are starting to attack the Spanish. And the Spanish are uh, surrounded and they're in a pretty weak position. There are a number of accounts of what then take, takes place, but I'll get your question in a second. We do know that the Spanish Cortez ask Moctezuma to speak and to try to calm the situation down and he, he is uh, told to, to go up on one of the walls to speak to the population and he does. Spanish accounts say that he's stoned by the 
uh, native people and is killed. The native accounts, none of which, which uh, talk about this incident, are actually from this time period. They're all fairly significant later, but the native accounts say that the Spanish killed Moctezuma. So we don't really know exactly what happened, but he does die. And the Spaniards are at a very dangerous point. Because now the Tlatoani has been killed, many of the other leaders have been killed, the Mexica are very angry, and they have now stopped being as passive as they were, and they have started to really respond. So the Spanish soldiers who have been systematically looting the palaces of the Mexica noble, high nobles, they gather up their silver and their gold, and they begin a retreat on June 30th of 1520. And this retreat ends in something of a catastrophe for the Spanish because that night, which is known as the Noche Triste or the Sad or Sorrowful Night, about half the Spanish soldiers were killed because they were on horses but very weighed down by gold, silver, and other um, goods that they had taken. And um, the Mexica soldiers, many of them are shooting arrows from the lake. Some of them are chasing. They're not on horse, but they chase after the Spanish. And there is a confrontation. About half the soldiers were killed. Um, many of the native allies were killed and many horses of the Spanish, which had, which had given the Spanish a great advantage. Many of the horses were killed as well. And a lot of the gold and silver actually ends up dumped and lost in the lake. And what happens is the Spanish are forced to retreat, and they have to uh, stay on the bridge and then go back to the mainland area, but off the island. They have to retreat. And the Mexica then try to blockade so that the Spanish can't re-enter the city. And that's the end. The Noche Triste is the end of the second phase. And things look pretty bad for the Spanish. And I think there was a question. So let me get the question and then. Can you use the microphone? Who is Aguilar? Aguilar is uh, one of the soldiers with Cortez. He's one of Cortez's uh, closest lieutenants. And he is the man who's left in charge of the soldiers, the Spanish soldiers who remain in the city when Cortez leaves the city to encounter the forces that had been sent by the governor of Cuba. So um, was it the lieutenant's idea to let them have that? Um yes, and he probably did it on purpose in order to carry out this attack. Uh, because his idea was that since he thought the nobles were plotting, he needed to uh, carry out a sort of preemptive strike, a kind of preemptive strike against the Mexica. But in doing so, the Spanish aren't prepared for the reaction that that then incites. And the reaction winds up in the Noche Triste when the Spanish realize that they're outnumbered. And because the soldiers have taken so many things with them, they can't effectively fight back. And some of their advantage of from the capture of Moctezuma is now gone because he's dead. And they aren't a, the being on horseback when they're all trying to uh, retreat at once turns out to be a real disadvantage and really hurts the Spanish. So some of the advantages that they had had politically and militarily were turned against them and they wind up retreating. Quick question, uh, what type of weapons did the Spanish carry with them during this time? Um, they, had, they had swords and many had uh, what are fairly primitive kinds of guns and their firepower was fairly, was fairly effective. But the question we have to ask and I think that your question leads to, even though the Spanish had armaments that were technologically far more sophisticated than anything the Aztecs had, who were fighting with uh, 
also with swords, but with obsidian, which is a kind of stone, obsidian projectile points. Um, and they're on foot, and the Spanish are on horses, and the horses give the Spanish a lot of advantage. But I think that the question you raise brings us naturally into asking, given this retreat and given the condition that the Spanish were in at, by the middle of 1520, how then do they go on to be successful? And their success comes out of both conditions and actions that the Spanish take during the third phase of the conquest of the Mexica when ultimately the Spanish lay siege to the city. How do they do this? Well, first they go back to the mainland areas. They uh, live in some of the communities with whom they've made alliances. They, those who are wounded are, but don't die, are nursed back to health. The Spanish also focus on rebuilding their alliances and strengthening those alliances to build up their army that way. They set about to build some new ships. And the reason they need to build new ships, well, they need ships that are more suited to the lake system, but also very early on after the Spanish had uh, created the town of Veracruz and were thinking about moving westward, Cortez had actually burned their ships, the ships that they had come from Cuba in. And the reason he did that was to give the Spanish the sense that, well, we can't go back, so we only can go forward. So at the beginning of the third stage, they do build some new ships, which they then have to use human power, human carriers uh, supplied by their allies to carry over mountains into, down into the bottom of the valley and into the city of, well, into the lake system that surrounds the city of Tenochtitlan. So they build these ships, they transport them, they build up their, their strength again, both their, their physical strength and their strength in terms of the size of their army. And by the spring of 1521, they are beginning, they, they are ready to undertake the very final phase. And this last, this very last phase of the conquest is structured around the siege of the city of Tenochtitlan. But there's one other factor which comes into play that I do need to point out. And that is that early in 1521, a new set of diseases, which will come to have an even more devastating impact on the Mexica and on the Aztecs more generally, a new set of diseases has begun to spread, and one in particular has broken out in Tenochtitlan, and that's smallpox. And this early smallpox epidemic most likely played a very important role because it is spreading among people for whom it's a new disease, so they have no immunity to it. And it's also spreading among people who have been fighting a war, who have seen their supreme ruler kill, captured and killed a set of events that were to them unimaginable, previously unimaginable. They're hungry because their whole, uh, the, their imperial system to some extent still exists, but obviously are, there are many cracks in it since Cortez has been able to attract allies, but there are also problems because goods can't move as they normally do because of the conditions of war. <coughs> 
So the disease spreads and it's very devastating and it causes many fatalities. In that context, the Spanish then set about not only to block the bridges like the Mexica were themselves trying to do, they set about to blockade the entire lake system, to cut off the residents of Tenochtitlan from any trade goods, which included fresh water. Because some of the lakes had fresh water, but some of the lakes had uh, salty water. And most of the water around Tenochtitlan was salty. So the Spanish set about to build up this blockade, to set in place this blockade, which will not allow, allow food, water, or trade goods into the city of Tenochtitlan in a situation where people are already hungry and many are dying of the disease of smallpox. So you get starvation, but still there is resistance. And this is not an easy fight because at this point the Spanish advantages have largely disappeared because the Spanish had retreated. They don't have control over any area of the city. And what the Mexica warriors, men, but women also do, because at this point, everybody begins to f fight because it's clearly a fight of desperation. And the Mexica are well aware that they are fighting not only the Spanish, but um, many people of their, their empire. The Mexica are on the roofs of the buildings, they are over the invading forces, they're able to use their arrows, their skills, their knowledge of the city very effectively. They engage in some guerrilla fighting tactics on the streets because of course they know the geography of the city better than anybody else, especially the Spanish. The horses at this point, this, the city is becoming such a mess because of all the fighting, the horses, and because the Spanish don't know their way around as well, the horses aren't much of an advantage. And so what the Spanish decide to do, given this resistance, even within the adverse circumstances for the Mexica, the Spanish decide that what they're going to do is they're going to burn the city down block by block. And that's what they do. They attack and start to raise the city block by block. The Mexica do have a final supreme ruler, Cuauhtémoc, who was related to Moctezuma, one of his nephews. The Mexica try to rally around him. But the Spanish invasion eventually proves too much. Cuauhtémoc is captured by the Spanish. Much of the city has been destroyed. And on August 21st, 1521, the remaining Aztec nobles and warriors surrender. And one can only imagine both the horror and the destruction that was the scene within Tenochtitlan on that day and after. The Spanish left many, many accounts of the conquest. Well, I should say many accounts. Many, many would be overstating it. They did leave many accounts. Uh, the Mexica also left some accounts, though most of the Mexica accounts are, are later, date, date from later often significantly later than the conquest period. But what is probably the earliest account, which dates from 1528, was written by some nobles in an adjoining city that was part of the conquest. And um, I'll, I just want to read this poem that's part of this account. And the, the poem, some of you may recognize um, a little bit of it at least, because the poem gives its name to a book, a book called Broken Spears, 
by um, the Mexican anthropologist and historian Miguel Leon Portilla. And Leon Portilla put together in the book Broken Spears many different uh, native accounts of life, culture, and of the conquest. And he includes in um, that book this, this uh, poem, which is translated from Nahuatl here into English. And I'll just, I'll just read it. Broken spears lie in the roads. We have torn our hair in grief. The houses are roofless now, and their walls are red with blood. Worms are swarming in the streets and plazas, and the walls are splattered with gore. The water has turned red as if it were dyed, and when we drink it, it has the taste of brine. We have pounded our hands in despair against the adobe walls. For our inheritance, our city is lost and dead. The shields of our warriors were its defense, but they could not save it. We have chewed dried twigs and salt grasses. We have filled our mouths with, with dust and bits of adobe. We have eaten lizards, rats, and worms. When we had meat, we ate it almost raw. And the account then goes on to talk about the Spanish and their desire for gold and um, other precious commodities. And it talks about the capture of Cuauhtémoc and what that meant. The conquest is important for a number of reasons. First, because the Spanish were able to succeed at all. And there were a number of different factors, and next week we can talk some about those factors that helped the Spanish to succeed. It's, in terms of military history, um, it remains today in the year 2007, uh, something that one just shakes one's head at that it actually took place. But as difficult as the conquest was, what in certain ways is most interesting, at least to me, is that this was only the beginning of what the Spanish had to do. Because the conquest didn't guarantee everything in terms of creating an empire. The Spanish would then have to create a colony and build an empire around that colony. And we will pick up with that next time.